sex played a large role in each of these schools of thought. At the heart of Taoism and Confucianism was the concept of yin and yang, opposite forces which make up the universe, nature, and the human body. Ancient Chinese physicians believed that yin and yang existed in both men and women in the form of essences. Men don't have to worry usually about an abundance of yang because they're male. They, they have yang. What they have to worry about sometimes is having not enough yin. So they need to try to balance out their overall life store. And sex can be useful because women have yin in abundance. Well, if the idea is to try to take in someone else's life store, what goes hand in hand with that is not giving up your own. Any man who could retain his semen was believed not only to enhance his chances of prolonging his life, but to acquire powers that would make most superheroes envious. Semen was seen as a source of power, and there's this idea that if you retain enough of your semen, you will gain superpowers, all sorts of things, ability to fly and to, to see through walls and all kinds of crazy things are attributed to people who can successfully retain their semen. The more you, you preserve your semen, you know, the healthier you become and eventually, uh, you know, immortality is possible. To aid their quest for immortality, many men turned to the Taoist sex manuals of the third century BC. As a result, these racy how-to books became runaway bestsellers. They provided men with a blueprint for lovemaking, and more importantly, a guide to preserving the all-important male yang. They lay out the basic physics that if you want to increase your, your health and extend your life, the way to do it is to extract life essence uh, from other people, and you can tell that they're written for men because the other people that they have in mind are female. One of the Taoist texts recommends if you can have sex with 40 women and soak up their yin, absorb their yin, without releasing any of your yang or sperm, this would be a tremendous enhancement towards the attainment of immortality. Women are not expected to achieve immortality in Taoism. This is something that men achieve. We're talking about very patriarchal, very male-dominated cultures here. Men who want to uh, practice this would prefer relatively young females because they have the, 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 the biggest, most powerful store of sex energy. A Taoist man usually took a teenage girl as a sex partner because she had not yet been contaminated by giving birth. The yin essence of these girls was considered especially potent. Younger partners, however, needed to be instructed in the ways of love and pleasure. Acrobatic sexual feats with names like gambling wild horses and the winding dragon were not taught in school. For that carnal knowledge, lovers turned to pillow books, such as The Secrets of the Jade Bedchamber. When the red flower shows its beauty and exhales its heady perfume, while she stays with you in the night and you play and take your pleasure with her, pointing at the pictures, you follow their sequence while she blushes and looks abashed and coyly protests. They were often uh, very graphically illustrated, showing the various positions that one was supposed to engage in. And some of these positions have great names, like the turtle and things. You know, sometimes only the names have survived, and then you just have to guess, you know, what? What was the turtle? <laughs> you know, what was that about? These sex manuals, also known as pillow books, offered young lovers a host of colorful expressions for their respective genitalia. In various chapters, the jade stalk was embraced by the cinnabar cleft. Or the heavenly dragon pillar might have a chance encounter with the golden lotus. 
And just how many ways were there for these poetically named private parts to get together? According to the master Tung Swan, there were 30 different sexual positions. In the second century BC, Confucianism became a state orthodoxy. Unlike Tao, which stressed the longevity of the man, Confucianism placed the utmost importance on family and procreation. This school of thought would change not only China's social structure, but its definitions of immortality and sexual pleasure. Confucius, the legendary Chinese philosopher, lived and taught in the 5th century BC. Three centuries later, his teachings, known as the Way of Humanity, joined Taoism as a popular philosophy among the Chinese. Taoist and Confucian beliefs differed when it came to the concept of family. Confucianism was very interested in the family and society. So whatever it took to, to create a strong family was acceptable. If this meant lots of sex, then that was, of course it meant lots of sex, because that's how you get a large family. With the rise of Confucianism, the concept of the ideal Chinese woman changed. Unlike Taoists, Confucians preferred more mature women who were mothers. Giving birth was not seen as a contaminant, but rather an advantage. This shift was reflected in Chinese sex manuals of the day, which were no longer geared solely for the man's pleasure. How do you entice the woman to have sex was a big theme in the Confucian sex manuals. Uh, you wanted to be good at seduction, and there were very clear lessons about that, like, for example, engaging in foreplay, making it pleasurable for the woman so that she'll want to uh, do it more, and if she does it more, she'll have more children. If the woman enjoyed sex, then she was going to have more sex, and she was going to bear more children. China was an agrarian society with a high infant mortality rate. Large families were necessary to harvest crops and run farms. One of the surest ways to ensure a large family was the practice of polygamy. Although rare, a wealthy Chinese man might have several wives. The first wife was the legal wife, while the subsequent wives were considered concubines. With so many women under one roof, a Chinese patriarch had to see to it that the forecast wasn't downgraded from clouds and rain to stormy weather. One king of ancient China presided over 121 wives, consorts, and concubines. In the course of a year, he was supposed to service each and every one of them. The emperor had the most concubines. It was sort of just the natural order of things, and so he would have hundreds. And uh, there was a, a special secretary who had to keep a roster of uh, who he was with each night. For the elite men faced with such daunting tasks, Chinese physicians developed potent aphrodisiacs. There's a, a, a bewildering uh, array of, uh, of ingredients. The blister beetle, which uh, we know in the West as Spanish fly, ginger, chicken feet, claws of a, of a rooster, and fingernails of a young girl, and you'll mash that together. After a while, no amount of bald chicken drug could sustain a Chinese patriarch in performing his husbandly duties. In an effort to get a little R&R, he paid a visit to the neighborhood brothel. These houses of ill repute were actually an escape from the world of the jade stalk and the golden lotus. The brothel wasn't just a place where you went for sex, it was a place where you went to socialize, it was a little bit of a, of a kind of a club, maybe a little bit like a, uh, a health club or a gym is today. You go to work out, uh, but you also have drink tea or wine, you socialize with your friends, uh, maybe you even transact some business. While upscale brothels were a forum for socializing, low-end establishments were strictly for sex usually provided by prostitutes too old or poor to work elsewhere. Some of these bordellos in the city of Chang'an 
had bamboo lamps with red silk coverings. Every city had its red light district. In fact, uh, the term red light district very likely comes from the red lantern that was lit from inside by some kind of candle to designate a, uh, a brothel. While Chinese men visited brothels, their wives and concubines were expected to remain at home. Although it wasn't unheard of for a woman to take a lover, adultery was seen as a disruption to the all-important family, and as such, was a crime punishable by death. Women in China suffered not only for sins such as adultery, but also in the pursuit of beauty. For many, many centuries, the bound foot was a tremendous kind of aphrodisiac for, for a Chinese man, and to be able to see and to kiss uh, the bound foot of, of a woman was an uh, enormous turn on. This practice is believed to have started with a palace dancer named Yao Niang around 1000 AD, who wrapped her tiny feet in strips of brightly colored silk when she performed for the royal court. Tiny feet hidden under silk ribbons soon became a sexual turn-on. It's a fetish that can't easily be rationalized. Sometimes a husband would never see his wife's um, unbound feet, and so for that reason, since it was inaccessible, it was uh, it was fetishized. So they're binding women's feet up, you know, which is an incredibly painful and agonizing experience, and they're barely able to walk. So it's it's another way of just controlling women, really. Even as foot binding's popularity spread during the Middle Ages, China itself was growing more conservative, a trend that continued up through the modern era. The secrets of the bedchamber would not be lost, however. For the legacy of erotic literature and exotic lovemaking created by the Chinese would be passed down to a younger country to the east, Japan. Founded by Emperor Jimmu in 660 BC, Japan had a rather sexual creation myth of its own. According to legend, Japan was brought into being by the male and female gods Izanami and Izanagi, who churned up the ocean with a jeweled spear to form the islands. Once the gods created Japan, they talked with each other about their bodies. So you don't, you don't have this idea of a, a male creator god coming along and going poof. There's an exchange between the male and female aspects of the divine that come together and, um, and bring forth Japan out of the Pacific Ocean. While Confucianism and Buddhism did have an impact in ancient Japan, the Japanese had their own unique beliefs regarding sex. The Japanese believed that the family was the backbone of daily life. So long as men took care of their families and fathered children, they were free to cavort with prostitutes and concubines. It was considered kind of uh, expected that men would have dalliances outside of marriage. And the women kind of put up with it. And they're probably having dalliances of their own, but they're not quite as open about it. It's not seen as kind of a natural thing for the man to only have sex with the wife. Unlike their Chinese counterparts, Japanese women of the 7th century often had multiple lovers and husbands. Aside from a man's wife, another highly important female in Japanese society was the prostitute. She played a vital role in stress relief for Japanese men. There was this idea that, that just being a prostitute didn't necessarily make you an immoral person. The prostitute gives her sexuality to relieve, relieve a kind of suffering. So she performs this service. She does, she does what's necessary to kind of um, keep society going. Prostitution was licensed and regulated by authorities beginning in the 13th century. 
but its most renowned era dawned during the Tokugawa period in the 1600s. The brothel was attached to uh, a whole way of life that involved music, dance, tea ceremony, uh, costumes. It wasn't just for sex, it was a whole entertainment quarter. It wasn't just a brothel. Around the same time, a lovely and talented woman emerged, the geisha. The origin of the geishas was considered to be the Shira Byoshi, who were the daughters of fallen aristocrats. Contrary to modern day beliefs, geishas were not simply prostitutes. The word geisha just means art person. It doesn't even imply prostitution. They, they had to be well versed in, in all of the arts, in performance, in, in singing, in poetry. You know, they were very uh, intelligent, well read, very high cultured women. They are very beautiful, very voluptuous, bejeweled, they are artistic, they dance. They are very advanced, um, they're intellectual. So these men are learning from the court. They're talented musicians. Music, of course, being a way to lure and attract people in. Courtesans become famous, and people travel to that city to, uh, to see them. Geishas and female prostitutes were not the only objects of desire for Japanese men. When a woman wouldn't suffice, they headed for the theater. Kabuki, where women's roles were played by men, was a haven for young male prostitutes, who often had affairs with shoguns and high-ranking samurai. These couplings with young boys did not affect their status in Japanese society. There was never the connotation of unnaturalness, uh, of something degrading, of sinfulness uh, attached to homosexual desire. Some of the most famous samurai warriors who were celebrated as these, you know, tough men with their swords and going out there doing manly things and killing people and all that were, were what we would call in today's terms um, gay. The worlds of the brothel, the geisha house, and the kabuki were immortalized in woodblock prints known as ukiyo-e. The most sexually graphic ukiyo-e prints were known as shunga. People were probably using them the same way people use pornography today to a certain extent, but they also weren't hidden. So they were, they were sold in shops, you know, openly, and they were put on people's walls. The fact that the ukiyo-e paintings and things were openly available and openly displayed uh, says a lot about the, the, the sexuality of the era. It was very free and very open. They weren't considered to be evil or vile or dirty. The Japanese and Chinese did not struggle with sexuality like so much of the Western world. Influenced by the philosophies of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism, they found balance and order in a universe that made ample room for a healthy sex life. When the history of sex returns, a glimpse inside the mysterious, sensual world of India, and an exploration of the secrets of the most famous sex manual in the history of the world. The Kama Sutra. For more than 2,000 years, sexuality and religion have been inseparable in India. Both men and women have sought unity with the divine through the pleasures of the flesh. The rich and vibrant sensuality found in India's various religions and philosophies can be traced back to its creation myth which is an erotic blend of nature and sex. We have this hymn, hymn of creation, and there you have the skies and the earth having an intercourse. And it's really done in very beautiful language, very graphic language. It's kind of a cosmic intercourse. 
and there's all kinds of uh, bodily fluids there. There's the water and there's the honey and it's really described beautifully, honey dripping. So it's really kind of this cosmic union. So this is what is in the Indian imagination. Despite India's many race and class distinctions, spirituality and sexuality remain tightly interwoven. For the Hindus, uh, sex is something cosmic, something ritualistic, something you just don't do for reproduction, but something for the divine. Much like the Greeks, the Indians took many of their cues, sexual and otherwise, from their gods and goddesses. The Indian gods engage in human activities, especially in sexual activities, and they are depicted as generating uh, the force of creativity through their own sexual desire for, for each other. The god Krishna embodied passionate love and enjoyed quite a reputation as a ladies' man. Oh, Krishna is the god of love. And then he plays around. So that's where you get the delight, you know, the aesthetic delight. The gods can play. And um, what does Krishna do? The girls have gone for a swim. He takes their clothes, perches himself up on a tree, and he won't return those clothes to the girls till he gets to have their hugs and kisses, and he gets to see them in the nude. While Krishna's Hindu devotees transcended earthly life through passionate love of their god, other prominent religions in India, such as Buddhism, discovered their own unique paths to enlightenment. Yoni is the womb, it is the female body, it is the fire, it is the source of enlightenment. There is a school of Buddhism that has this idea that, that the Buddha resides in the yoni, um, that sees sex as a way towards enlightenment. Not all followers of the Cherubic God went through the yoni in their search for eternal bliss. Several schools of Buddhist monks and nuns chose a life of celibacy in a monastery. The original Buddhist monks believed that in order to meditate properly, you had to forego the temptations of, of the flesh because that gets in the way of the meditative life. An existence devoid of earthly delights did not appeal to everyone. In the third century, a pleasurable alternative emerged in Hindu society with history's most exotic sex manual, the Kama Sutra. Nouveau riche merchants who wanted to define their lovemaking techniques found the Kama Sutra an invaluable aid. The Kama Sutra shows the idea that sexuality is something that's to be learned, that's to be done in a refined way, that the more you know and the more skillful you are at it, the more enjoyable it will be for both the man and the woman. Like Hindu society, which believed in the categorization and classification of everything from social class to food, the Kama Sutra provided an extensive inventory of all things sexual. Among the erotic tome's many lists were several types of love bites and scratches, four kinds of love, eight stages of oral intercourse, and 30 sexual positions, some of which might be better left to contortionists. Much like an automobile owner's manual, the Kama Sutra provided solutions for virtually every sexual predicament, even a man's physical shortcomings. It talks about different techniques of uh, penis enlargement, so that, uh, you know, putting weights uh, on the penis, it sounds kind of horrible, actually, uh, but size counts in the, <laughs> in the Kama Sutra. The Kama Sutra proved useful not only in the bedroom, but with the written word as well. Poets often used it as a sexual thesaurus. There might be reference to the ringing of a woman's bells. The bells were worn as a kind of a fashion thing, and so if the girdle bell is ringing, that means the woman is on top, and if the ankle bell is ringing, that means the woman's on the bottom. Um, it's just a way to talk about sex without, without being too direct. 
The Kama Sutra encompassed much more than the secrets of sexual pleasure. It also provided a blueprint for courtship and marriage. When the history of sex continues, a look at marriage, taboos, and the mysterious sexual practices of Tantra. With its publication in the third century, the Kama Sutra found a vast audience in India. Among the more avid readers of the sex manual were young, upwardly mobile men, known as Nagarakas. The Nagarakas were upper-class men who devoted themselves to uh, sexual pleasure and to a, a, a kind of refined sexuality. They are kind of aesthetes, people who know how to perfume themselves and oil their hair and enjoy walking. In cases where it took more than the Kama Sutra to impress a woman, a Nagaraka enlisted the help of his feathered friend, the parrot. They would talk to them and try to uh, get them to learn certain phrases. They would want to be witty. They would want what the bird said to represent their aesthetic. Come up and see my parrot. Teaching the parrots to, to say dirty words and create a, a more charged uh, atmosphere. But again, it's a celebration of sexuality and of sexual desire, but also the imperative to be good at it, to learn techniques, to create a more intense experience. The women most appealing to Indian men were not unlike Barbie dolls in their appearance. Goddesses were also depicted in this way. It's also an ideal female type. An extremely small waist with full hips and breasts the size of melons, the weight of which actually causes the woman to walk with her shoulders a little bit forward. In the end, a woman's physical attributes were of little consequence when it came to marriage. In higher castes, marriages were arranged by families, often without the bride and groom having ever met. This was a traumatic period for an Indian bride, who was usually under the age of 12. Once the bride reached puberty, she would move in with her husband and in-laws. The switch between the natal and the in-laws family, your married family, is a very severe one. I mean, you're a daughter, your parents take care of you, and once you go to your in-laws, that's it. You've broken everything with your natal family. You're really their daughter. After moving in with her husband, a new bride would often refrain from having intimate relations on her first night with him. Indian literature celebrated the romance of waiting. In the romantic context, there's much more discussion about longing. This is the great desire to be away from your lover and long for them. A very famous play by playwright Kali Dasa is called The Cloud Messenger, and the male lover is looking at the cloud and say, please carry my love to my beloved. Not all Indians embrace such traditional notions of romance and sex. Some elite men and women sought physical pleasure through the breaking of sexual taboos. Beginning in the 6th or 7th century, a philosophy known as Tantra emerged. Tantra, which combined elements of Buddhism, Hinduism, and other religions, broke many of the religious and sexual laws of Indian society. It was a strain of Buddhism that stressed the idea of achieving enlightenment through sexual pleasure. And again, through a refined kind of sexual pleasure, very intense, so intense that it achieves a kind of spiritual dimension. The exteriors of various temples throughout India display tantric sex. These stony images could easily be mistaken for a licentious game of Twister. Some of the imagery is very lewd and very crazy, and they'll show people within with these uh, very elaborate sex positions and, and sometimes physically impossible positions. They'll depict people in things that you go, oh, nobody could do that. Tantric orgies 
in which men and women were supposed to distance themselves from the pleasure of sex, were overseen by mystical gurus. It was considered to be a very kind of dangerous path that not too many people were able to, to walk because it was so, it was so tricky. Tantrists often carried out their forbidden sex rituals in the darkened cemeteries of India. This late night frolicking didn't raise the dead, but it did awaken the sleeping serpent within the participants. One form of Tantra was the Kundalini. You know, you have this kind of serpentine energy dormant in your own body. And how do you awaken it? So you can do through meditation, through sex, through yoga practices, many ways of kind of, kind of energizing it. In India, even in the present day, there are numerous paths, not only to enlightenment, but to sexual pleasure. In Western thought, these concepts of sexuality and spirituality are often at odds with each other. But in the last half century, we have started to look more closely at Eastern philosophies for answers to questions of the spirit and flesh. How did Eastern ideas of love, sex, and romance traverse the thousands of miles and immense cultural divide that separated the East and West? The answer lies in the Middle East, a land that gave us Arabic love poetry and tales of the harem. In the late 8th century AD, Baghdad became a thriving center of trade. This cosmopolitan setting provided a forum not only for the exchange of goods, but for sharing ideas and philosophies as well. The predominant religion in Baghdad was Islam, which was founded in 1622 AD by the prophet Muhammad. Muhammad spread the word of God through the Quran, a holy book that provided Muslims with a guide for life, love, worship, and even sex. There was a very strong erotic tradition in the Arab world, and the Quran certainly you know, doesn't forbid sexual pleasure and for men or for women. In fact, it's grounds for divorce if, if one or the other partner is not uh, satisfied. At the heart of the Muslim religion, like other religions in the East, was the belief in family. The Arab world was patriarchal, and polygamy was a recognized practice. According to the Quran, a Muslim man was allowed to take a maximum of four wives. Much like the Chinese, Muslim men were required to treat each of their wives equally. This included sexual pleasure, an area that was not ignored in the teachings of Islam. The man and the woman deserve pleasure. The Quran is very clear on that. The Prophet himself had nine wives. Certainly polygamy was always a part of Islam, so that may not be a celebration of sexuality per se, as it is just a kind of practical social arrangement for the man to have as many offspring as possible. In cases other than poor performance in the bedroom, divorce was much simpler for a man than a woman. He simply had to say, I divorce thee three times, and the marriage was terminated. In some cases, an Islamic marriage was brought to an end in a much more severe fashion. If a man or woman committed adultery, the penalty